So today we are going to learn a little bit more about stress and also another factor that's really important with respect to understanding how materials carry load and what they do while they carry load. And that other parameter we're going to learn about today is called strain. Okay. Um, and so by way of introduction of the idea of strain, what I'm going to do is go back to our unrealistic material model, right? Unrealistic, but very simple. And yet, you know, it, it does, uh, at least for our purposes here, it does accurately reflect what real materials do uh, on average, even though the bonding, you know, kind of scheme inside of a real material is more complicated than the way I'm showing it up here. Okay. The idea still holds. So over there on the left, what you see there is an example of one unstretched bond, right? So this is, again, about the smallest piece of material that we can think about, uh, just two particles with one bond in between them, okay? And think about what happens if you take this, uh, you know, this little piece of material right here and you uh, begin to load it, okay? So... There it is. It was unloaded. Now we're going to put a force on it. Okay. So when we put the force on it like this of F, what happens? It stretches. Okay. So stretch it out to about like that. All right. Now, what we've talked about up till now is the idea of how much does it take to break a bond? you know, between a piece of material. Today we're talking about before we break it, it's going to stretch some, right? We're going to talk about in that zone before it actually breaks, how does it stretch and can we characterize how it stretches, okay? So for this example now, uh, where this thing was, you know, on the page there, it looks like it's about, it was about four uh, little squares long. Now it looks like it's about five little squares long because we have applied this force of F to that little bond. Okay. Well, my next question is this. What if I now apply the same force to this little chain of the same kind of material? So we imagine that these bonds are going to more or less be the same type of bonds as, as the first case, right? We don't expect there to be any difference between how these bonds behave. And now I apply a force of F to this chain. Okay. With me so far? What's it going to do? Okay. So what we're going to do is now stretch this to the point where uh, the, you know, I'll try to make it about right, but to where one of the bonds now is about five squares long, right? Why do you think I do that? Like I've looked at one of these little bonds, and I'm going to stretch it out to where now it's five squares long, instead of four. Right, any one bond is going to stretch about the same amount. So if we apply a force of F to this chain, each bond we now expect would stretch about the same as what the last one stretched, right? And yet what happens with the overall length of the chain? Okay, it gets longer based on how many bonds there are. Uh, is the suggestion here, and it gets proportionally longer if it started out longer, right? That makes sense, right? It, if it started out being longer, then you apply a force to it, it's going to stretch more. Any one bond hasn't stretched more, but the fact that you've got a larger number of them chained together means that the overall thing will stretch more, okay? What we would like to do is come up with a parameter, kind of like we did for stress where we came up with a parameter you know, stress is a parameter that essentially describes, on average, how much force is any one bond carrying, right? And that way we know whether or not we're close to breaking it, because any one bond can hold some amount of force. And so, you know, if we have a parameter that tells us about how much force any one bond is carrying, then that helps us to know if we're close to breaking the material. Well, this time what we want to do is figure out another parameter that tells us how much is any one bond stretching. Okay, and what we're seeing here is that that's going to be a function of how many of them we have chained together. So what we'd like to do is eliminate that factor, right, and get back to what, how much does any one bond stretch. And so 
Uh, what I would suggest here is that, you know, let's say that, you know, this little guy stretched by one, uh, this was the, the difference in length now of this piece was one little square, right? What would you expect the difference in length to be for this guy? Three squares because each bond is giving you a square, right? And so if I wanted to come up with a consistent way of describing how much any one bond stretched, and I wanted to do that on more of a macro scale instead of a micro scale, what would be a good way of doing that? Let's say I apply a force to this, uh, this little block of material here. And under that force that we apply to the little block of material, it then stretches by some amount, right? So now it, it has a new length coming out to about here. under that force that I apply to that. And let's give that a name, okay, or a, a variable at least. We, we typically call this uh, deformation, and we give it a variable. This is a change in length is what we're talking about there, okay? So it started out one length and it changed. The variable we usually give it is a lowercase Greek delta, okay? So now my question is this, if I want to come up with a, a parameter now that describes on average how much did any one of the bonds stretch, what would I do in terms of my macro dimensions that I have on this body? What would be a way to eliminate the factor that we just identified that said the longer this piece started out, the more it will stretch even if it's not under any more load? Okay, we could divide by something, I wouldn't say cross section, because the the cross section kind of describes how does it divide up the force that it's feeling, right? It has to divide that across a certain number of bonds. Well, this time, let's say we have, uh, you know, a uniform, we're, we're making that uniform, the same amount of force per bond. We're trying to figure out how much now does it stretch, right? And, uh, and we want to have a value for, on average, how much does one bond stretch? Well, to normalize this, just like we had up here, if I, if I say we stretched by one, but the original length was four, I could basically take one divided by four, right? And that would be how much we stretched per bond, right? You know, it started out being four units long and, it, and we stretched by one little unit. Down here, how many units did we start out long? Four times three, right? So we started out four times three long, all right? and we stretched by three. So if I take four times three, which is 12, and I stretched by three, I'm stretching by three, dividing by 12, what is that fraction? One over four, which is the same as the one before it. What I'm trying to motivate here is that if we take the amount that we stretch and we divide by the original length, then we'll have a parameter that we'll track with uh, with however much one bond is stretching in the material. It will scale proportionally to however much one bond in the material is stretching. Does that make sense? Okay, so if I go ahead and identify that this thing started out being, you know, L long, and now it stretches by delta, then if I take uh, L over, or excuse me, delta over L, Okay, then that should be a good parameter for us to discuss uh, how much any one bond might be stretching in the material. Okay, and that is exactly how we define something that we call normal strain. Okay, normal strain, which we give the little Greek epsilon as a letter uh, to talk about this. It's just going to be the change in length over the original length. And uh, just so I'm complete with this, there are actually some interesting other definitions of strain um, that uh, I don't want to get too, hard, too far in the weeds, but uh, if you begin to stretch this thing, then you could make an argument that, that would say you probably should keep up with how much you already stretched it to figure out what the original length should be at any given position of how much you stretch it more. 
That's that idea. If you apply an idea like that, you can come up with something that's called true strain. All right. We're not going to deal with that because we're close enough by just saying original or how much did it change in length divided by the original length and just call it good. This type of strain is known as engineering strain. All right. So we just say that's good enough to talk about what was the original length and how much did it change and we'll define strain like that. Okay. So that's normal strain. I want to point out here that in normal strain, the, uh, the direction that the part is extending, so in other words, the, um, you know, the axis along which this, this thing is moving, right, is parallel with the direction of the applied force, right, but also the direction of the original length of the part is also along that same direction. Right, so the, the L that we're talking about here was already measured parallel with the direction we're applying the force, and it's also parallel with the direction that it's uh, extending, okay? Well, you might get the idea that I'm setting something up that maybe not all of them are like that. Like maybe there are other kinds of strain besides normal strain. Would you get that kind of feeling? Okay. And you would be correct to think that there's something else coming. So let's actually slide down here a little bit. Let's talk about shearing strain. Okay. So with shearing strain, you imagine taking a little piece of material and applying a force kind of in the same direction as we did when we talked about shearing stress, right? And under a uh, force like this, how does this little block deform? would you say? I think we talked about this briefly last time too. Okay. It's going to actually turn into a bit of a parallelogram. And by the way, how much real materials really do this is usually pretty small, right? I'm exaggerating it like crazy so that we can see it on the diagram, but they do this, right? They do actually skew a little bit in shape under this applied uh, force as I'm showing here. Okay, so let's say that this is the new uh, shape of the material under this applied force. Okay, well, how much deformation is there here? Where's a, where's a reasonable place to measure the deformation? Okay, we could say this point over here I'm just picking a point, but let's say you pick a point, you say, where did that point move to, right? So that point moved to there. So the amount of, of change that happened is right here, okay? And so let me actually name that. I'm gonna call that delta, but with a sub S on it to kind of mean that's my, uh, you know, my change in position in a kind of a shearing orientation. All right. So now my next question is this. What if I had another block that I did something similar with and I applied the same amount of shearing stress to another block, but it had a different cross section to it uh, sort of this way, right? The, the different size of cross section to it that I'm showing in green, right? What if it had a different size that way, but I still applied the same stress? Would you expect the same strain if I had the other dimensions being the same? Okay, so the green, let's say the green size increases in size, but we would increase force proportionally so that we kept the same stress. And then I also kept the same height. Should I have the same amount of deformation, less, more? What do you think? No idea? It's okay if you don't have any idea. I would, I would submit to you that we should probably have about the same amount of strain, okay? Because any one bond is going to be experiencing some level of skew, right? And we're applying the same stress in both cases. So any one bond is, is experiencing the same amount of um, sort of deformation there. And so, what really matters with respect to this is not necessarily the size of the base, but more the size of the height, right? So let's now take another example. What if I took a block that was otherwise the same size, 
and apply the same kind of stress to it, but change this dimension to where it, now it's taller, like this. Okay, and I apply the same stress to this block, and I want to figure out what does it do. What do you say? Okay, same direction, right? Someone just said it's going to deform the same way, but more. Okay, and I, I like that thought. Didn't draw that super well, but call it good right there. My, my guess is that this delta value that I have right here will increase as a result of changing the height of that block. Okay, so I know it's kind of taken a, a second to really describe this, but the way that you would normalize how much you would expect any one bond to have skewed is based on taking that change in length under the applied stress, and instead of dividing by a length in the direction of that change in position, right? we're now going to divide it by a length that goes this way. right? Because if you go taller and taller and taller, you would expect to have more and more skew under this applied stress. Okay? So, hopefully that, that kind of makes sense to you, and I will say uh, the letter that we often use for uh, shearing strain is gamma. And how do we define it, you think? Okay, let me. Uh. Okay. This is shearing strain. Is gamma, and you're saying delta S, right? And, uh, you know, I really probably should have drawn this L over here because that's where I also have my delta S. I want to kind of explain it for the same piece of material. Okay. Delta S over L. Okay. Same definition. What's the one thing that changed? Okay. Now, uh, the change in position which is delta S is perpendicular to the length that we care about. Okay? That height. All right, so that's our definition of shearing strain. And I have to go off in the weeds just a little bit here now, all right, and talk about something that's a little bit interesting. Um, have you guys ever heard of something called the small angle approximation? Okay, this is something that uh, people who like kind of the mathematician way of thinking about things, they don't like this very much. People who operate more in the engineering side of the, of the house, we love this because it makes things easier and it works well enough. Okay? So, small angle approximations. Okay? So, let's, let's start with, uh, this is for trig functions. So, let's start with the sine function. Let's say I've got, you know, a set of axes here where this is y and this is x, and I want to plot the function y is equal to the sine of x. What does that function look like? Okay. It's a sinusoidal curve, right, that's going to be centered so that it passes through 0, 0 there. Close enough, right? Okay. Next question is, what if I take the derivative of that curve and set the, uh, the place where I want to evaluate that derivative equal to zero, the x location where I want to evaluate the derivative equal to zero? Okay. So first of all, what's the derivative? 
Okay, cosine. Okay, and now I want to do that at x equal to 0. Okay, so y prime at x equals 0 is 1. Right? What does that tell me geometrically? Okay, what it tells me is that if I take a tangent line to this curve that passes through 0 right there, what's the slope of that line? Okay, and a, a line with slope of 1 that passes through 0 has what equation? Okay, which means if I take a very small range on either side of that curve, right, then it is close enough for me to say that the sine of x is approximately equal to x as long as I'm in a tight little range to either side of that point, right? How far can you go? Believe it or not, it's farther than you might think uh, before you start getting large amounts of error, all right? Okay, good with me so far? I'm not going to give you an actual value of how far you can go because you can figure it out yourself exactly how much error you have the further you go away from zero. But as long as you stay pretty close in there, this, that's, that's a uh, relationship that holds pretty well. There is one other thing I should say about it. Um, how do you have to measure your angles in order for that to actually work? You got to use radians to be measuring your angles in order for that to actually work. Okay. Good. Shall we do this for another example? What about the cosine? Make it a little bit smaller here so we can fit. What's the cosine function look like? Okay, y equal cosine x. What's our cosine function look like? Okay, sine function, but now shifted to where there's a peak at zero, right? Something like this. Okay, where this is x and this is y. Okay. Well, now my question is this. What is y prime for this function? Okay. Well, what is y prime at x equal 0. Now, we, we did that uh, kind of formally with calculus there, right? But we could have done that without the calculus, probably. What would we have seen? I'm asking, what is the slope at 0? Right? It's a horizontal line. So now my next question is, if we stay really tight in on this one, you know, say a little range right around zero. How could we approximate cosine of x? Okay. That, so the, really the question there is, you know, what's this value? And I would say that for any of these, you know, for this trig function, either sine or cosine, the peaks happen at what height? One. Okay. And it doesn't vary because the slope is zero. Right? So this height is one. And so I would say the cosine of x, as long as the angle x is small, is approximately equal to one. All right, now at this point you're kind of saying, we are really on a tangent now, right? Glad you mentioned that, right? Because that's what we need, a tangent. What is the tangent function? Okay. 
What's a, what is one of the identities for the tangent? Sine of x over the cosine of x. Okay? If x is small, what is this going to be approximately equal to? x, right? If sine of x is approximately equal to x and cosine of x is approximately equal to 1, as long as we have small angles, right, then the tangent of x is approximately equal to x, okay? And so now you, you might really be thinking, this is, this is bizarre. Why would I need any of that, okay? Well, let me show you why you might want that. Let's go back up to this triangle that we made right here. Okay, and I'm going to draw that triangle separately right down here. That triangle has a height of L, and it has a length up here on the top of delta S, and it's a right triangle. Okay, let me define an angle right here, and I'll just give it some name. What is the tangent of phi for that triangle? Delta S, okay, over L. Okay, well that's exactly what we had up here, delta S over L, okay? And so what I'm trying to motivate here is this, even though we we started out with a definition that wasn't any different than normal strain, right? It was a change in position divided by some length, and that gave us this shearing strain. We can prove easily enough, as long as the angles aren't too big, that that's pretty much just the same thing as the angle that is formed when it begins to deform. Okay? And you got to see a little bit of uh, small angle approximations along the way. So that's fun. So all I would say here is that usually what we do is say that the shearing strain um, is just this angle that is formed once the, the body begins to deform. But I wanted to motivate that it's really not a different definition other than the fact that the length that you're, cha that you're measuring to normalize how much you have deformed right, is perpendicular to the direction that it's deforming. Right? All right. That takes a little bit to show you that, but um, small angle approximations are, are very important in a lot of areas of engineering, and so I figured this is a good chance as any to uh, get you introduced to the idea of them. All right, well, that's good stuff. Uh, what I wanna do now is I want us to think about should there be relationships between stress and strain, okay? So let's actually go back up here again. And you might have wondered why I didn't do anything with these other blocks right here. Let's get back to them and, and start looking at them. So for the unstretched block up there on the top, now I've got four bonds, right? So what would, how much force would it take to apply to that entire face, right? How much force would it take to apply to that and apply to this, right, in order to have each bond carrying the same amount of force as the cases on the left side? 4F. Okay. And what I'm trying to motivate here is this idea that um, the amount of stretch that we have per bond should be related to the amount of uh, force per bond, but what we really have for those numbers are stress and strain, right? The amount of force per bond is stretch, stress, and the amount of stretch per bond is strain, right? And so we could have 4F there, and once we put 4F on there, any one of the chain of chains of bonds is going to stretch the same way as we had over on the left side, right? So. I didn't label this earlier, but what I should put on here is that this is happening under some amount of stress, right? 
And under that amount of stress, I should, ex I should see the thing uh, exhibit a relatively constant amount of strain as long as we aren't failing the material. Okay? And in fact, that is what we see. And the same thing happens here where, you know, we might need to put on 4F here and 4F here to account for all of the different bonds that we have. So we're going to stretch that um, with that value, and it should stretch the same as the case over there on the left side. All right, so hopefully this motivates it just a little bit um, that there should be a relationship between stress and strain, and in fact there is. And we as engineers, I don't know if you've ever heard uh, kind of the idea that engineers get to break things. How many of you started, you know, started engineering with this idea that I want to be an engineer because I hear engineers get to break things? Okay, I see a couple hands. There's usually a few, all right? Um, yes, we get to break things. Here's the thing, though. Breaking things tends to be expensive, right? But you kind of need to, you need to break things in order to know what does it take to break things, right? My son is five years old, and he is experimenting with this almost constantly, right? He loves breaking things. Why? Because every time he does, he learns something, right? That's how much it could take before it broke, right? And then he looks at it, and whatever his toy was that just broke, he has this, you know, short period of joy for having broken it, and then he realizes now his toy is broken, right? So this happens a good bit. My point with this is that, yes, as engineers, we get to break things, but also as engineers, we are trying to do this so that we maximize how much we learn from it and we minimize how much it costs. Does that make sense? So we want to make sure we learn as much as we can from as low a cost of a you know, experiment where we break things as possible. So in other words, we don't want to build a part that costs you know, $10,000 and then try it out and try to break it first. We want to learn something about whether or not we think it might break before we break that thing. If we could break a $5 item and learn something, so that something that we could then maybe apply to the $10,000 item, that would be a good deal, right? And that is exactly what we do in engineering. We do material testing, and we do it on relatively simple specimens, right? One of the most common shape of specimen looks like, this is often called a dog bone, right? And it's built to where it has a round, circular uh, cross-section to it. And what we do with a specimen in order to learn something about the material it's made out of, first of all, when we make the specimen, we try to make it in a way that we have fully specified the exact manufacturing process it took to make that material, right? So we, if it was heat treated, we try to be very careful about how it's heat treated so that it's exactly the kind of material that's going to be like the thing we make our ultimate part out of, right? Or if it's going to be... You know, there's another process that's called cold working, which involves intentionally, uh, you know, deforming something permanently, right? We try to figure out exactly how it was cold worked so that we can make the specimen into such a material that's exactly the kind of material that we want to build our part out of ultimately, okay? So we start there and say, you know, get reasonably confident that we've applied the same types of, uh, of manufacturing process to the specimen, but then we put it into a machine, and the machine will apply a force to it, like this. And that's called tensile, test, tensile testing, or tensile testing. Is, you know, we usually kind of slur that together a little bit. But we put a tensile force into the specimen. But we don't just put a tensile force into the specimen and, and uh, pull it until it breaks. We want to learn as much as we can from it while it's breaking. Okay. So what do you think we do? Okay. One thing we do is before we stretch it or anything, actually in the process of building the specimen, we want to make sure we know exactly what this diameter is to as close as we can measure it. Why? Okay. We're pretty sure that's, it's going to break somewhere in that little neck right there, right? 
Why do we want to know that diameter and hopefully as accurately as possible? Okay. We're going to be able to measure with our tensile testing machine, we're going to be able to measure how much force we put on this thing. Right? It's for us to know how much stress happens on that, on that little spot right there, we need to know the diameter so we can calculate the area. Right? So we measure that and we say, this little right, this little you know, area right there, uh, we compute what's called a gauge area. Okay, so that's one of the things we try to measure carefully. What else do you think we might want to measure carefully? The length, and actually, what you do is you uh, you pick a couple of points, you know, maybe one up here and one down here and you accurately measure what was that length, right? What do you think you might call that? Maybe a gauge length, right? So you've, you've tried to accurately measure the area of the part that's carrying the stress, and then we measure a little gauge length right there and what we'll do is, you know, usually at that point, the, uh, the equipment that does the tensile testing has another uh, attachment that it, it attaches to it. And basically, it like clamps on right here and clamps on right here. And then some super accurate instrumentation is able to track that length right there live as we begin to stretch it, okay? So we start stretching it, and what we care about there is not so much the actual length itself. What we care about is how much did it change in length, right? So out of this right here, we can derive a change in length. And we will be able to relate that change in length to how much force is being applied because both of those things will be measured by the tensile testing machine as it breaks the piece of material, okay? And, uh, you know, I'm going to, at some point, I'm going to show you on one of these machines back here, we have the, you know, these types of things set up on one of those machines, and I'll be able to show it to you. By the way, the little piece of, uh, of instrumentation that measures that delta, uh, that's called an extensometer if you want a fancy word for that. It measures how much did it change in length. All right, did I see a hand over here? No, just stretch it. All right, so this is what we do with a, with a specimen like this. And so the next question is, what do you think we're likely to see um, if we take our force of F, right, and we plot it against, what do you think? Delta, right? Those are the two things we're trying to simultaneously measure. And so let's say we end up with a, a set of axes here where we're plotting F relative to delta, okay? So F there and delta down here, okay? So there's going to be some phases of this piece of materials behavior, right? We just finished talking about a, a range of this materials behavior where all your bonds are stretching, right? They're not breaking yet. They're just stretching, right? So if we plot this or if we, if we look at this curve, there is going to be a region of this curve where there's almost an exact straight line. Okay, so that as we apply more and more force, there's a, you know, change in length that starts to increase proportionally to that change in force. Okay. All right, well then at some point inside the material, there is a point of, of uh, stress where the first bond in the material says, I've had too much and that first bond breaks, okay? Now, 
I'm going to add another little thing on this and that you probably have in mind that this is some kind of metal. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. It doesn't have to be metal, but let's say that this is some kind of metal, you know, of the variety that we're probably used to. Metals have an interesting characteristic to them in that they are, uh, they have a property that's called ductility. Ductility basically means that they can change shape without losing strength. They can like permanently deform without losing strength. The reason why that is on an internal like particle by particle basis is that when the bonds inside of that material begin to break, they are basically open to rebonding with other material that's nearby. So let's say two bonds that were near each other both broke. Well, those two bonds are now available and they hook up again, right? So this is basically the, you know, as the bonds are breaking, they don't mind looking around to try to see if there's something else to hook up to and it doesn't lose its strength, right? And it begins to deform. So what happens with this curve as those bonds begin to break and reform, this curve starts to become very nonlinear and it might take on a shape that looks something like this. As a matter of fact, that's what most of them do if you test them all the way to failure. The curve will be very linear at first and then after a while the material begins to permanently deform and the curve goes to where it's very nonlinear. And I put an X out there at, at that point, what do you think that might mean? Yeah, that's where it actually comes apart, actually goes into two different pieces. Okay. Now, there's something about this curve that, you know, causes a lot of people, you know, to go, huh? Like, why does it do that? And it's this. Why does the curve curve back down? Okay, the bonds break down. At some point, it starts to take less force, even though you, you keep on increasing that deformation at a, uh, you know, at a particular rate that takes less and less force at some point to do that. Okay, very good. So one of the things that happens with these specimens is that at some point there's a, uh, a behavior they start to exhibit and we're never exactly sure where it will occur, where it will occur uh, in that gauge portion of the specimen, but it will start doing something that's called necking. And what that is, is that some relatively local location, uh, the cross-sectional area begins to change rapidly. Okay? And that's called necking. Well, basically, uh, where this thing starts to drop lower, what that, what's happening there is that the material has begun to neck. And so even though, uh, you know, we, we would imagine this is a, a uh, decrease in the amount of stress, it isn't really because what's happening is you are decreasing the amount of area. So just because the force is decreasing, it doesn't mean the actual stress it's experiencing in that neck is decreasing. What's happening is the area is decreasing, right? All right, so that's about what this thing does, okay? Um, I wanna change this chart just a little bit because right now what we've done is one specimen. Okay, we've tested one specimen and let's say we did that and this is the data that comes out. That data is not nearly as uh, widely applicable as it could be yet because we arbitrarily chose the size of the specimen. In other words, we chose what that gauge area was going to be and we chose, chose what the gauge length was going to be. And so what comes out of here could be different if someone else chose a different sp size of specimen, right? I'm, I made one, let's say, where the gauge length is one inch and the diameter is a quarter inch, okay? And I do this test, I'm gonna get one set of values for F and delta. Let's say my buddy makes one that has a two inch long gauge length and a half inch gauge area or a gauge diameter, right? So. His results, as far as the size of this curve, are going to be different than mine because he chose a different size of specimen. Is there a way that he and I could wind up with about the same answer? Okay. I think I hear a few of you saying, what if we take the force, 
and we divide it by the gauge area. And instead of plotting force, we plot that value, force over gauge area. Okay. Also, what if we take the deformation delta, and instead of plotting it directly, we plot it divided by what, you think? Gauge length. Okay. What do I have as far as that fraction on the left? That's now a value that's in stress. That is how much stress the gauge portion of the, of the material is carrying. And what about the uh, delta over L? That's strain. And so my point with this is that for both of those, all I'm doing is dividing by a constant value, right? So it won't change the shape of the curve the fun, you know, fundamental shape of the curve, it just scales the curve, right? It's going to scale differently because I'm dividing each of these values by a constant, okay? And so it, what I'll basically say is that instead of this being F and delta, now this curve can be expressed in terms of stress and strain, okay? And what I'm showing there is called a stress-strain curve for this material. And now it is independent of the specific dimensions that I chose for my specimen. I could choose one set of dimensions, and a buddy of mine could choose totally different dimensions. We should come up with roughly the same curve, because the curve is now describing something that is purely a material, you know, f a function of just the material, not a function of the size of the specimen. Right? So, and what we're coming up with is how does the nature of how the bonds stretch relate with how the bonds carry force. OK. Now let's actually look at a few other things on this curve. Okay, What's one thing that you feel like might matter that we might want to sort of, once we've done this for a type of material, we might want to publish our results? Like if someone's trying to design a machine and they want to use this kind of material to design their machine, what are some nature, what are some of the pieces of this curve that you think they might find interesting? Okay, so a lot of times one of the first ones people look, think of is the slope of this linear portion. Because that's an indicator of how stiff this material is. Yeah. Okay, the point at which it goes into plastic deformation. That's another thing that might matter. So you're looking up here, you're saying there is a limit where at some point it's no longer linear. And now it's gone up into this part where it's nonlinear, and that's, you know, he used the term plastic deformation. That's exactly what we call that. Over here to the left side, that is, you know, anything over here to the left, this is considered to be elastic. And anything over here to the right is called plastic deformation. Okay? So that's another interesting thing. Can you think of anything else that's interesting? OK. Now, when people say breaking point, usually what people say they think of is they think of, where is this x over here? And this is a little counterintuitive, but I'm going to tell you that where exactly that x is located, that actually doesn't matter very much. OK. Here's the reason why. When we're testing these pieces of material, when it gets to the end of this curve, it's not very constant exactly what happens. And the reason why is that this necking has begun to occur. And so that's a little bit of a chaotic, uh, uh, I don't know, the behavior of it's a little bit chaotic, right? How exactly it necks isn't necessarily the same every single, for every single specimen every single time. So sometimes this curve might end right where we showed it. Sometimes it might actually fall off and end up with a kind of a downward line like this, and it's not very constant or consistent where exactly that breakage occurs. Okay? So he, he says, what about the necking point? And I would even say, yes, what I'm, what I'm curious about is just how high did that curve get, right? That is another factor that would be important to us. Okay? As a matter of fact, you guys were very good at picking out, in concept, 
the three things that matter most to us about this curve, right? So let's talk about them and actually give them some names, right? You guys mentioned the slope first. So this slope over here is, you could measure it in terms of, of uh, you know, stress and strain, right? How much stress do I have for a particular amount of strain? And that slope is called the elastic modulus, okay? So the elastic modulus, we use a capital letter E, okay? And that's going to be equal to stress over strain, okay? And I'll say, with the parentheses next to it, in the elastic region. Okay, so E there, um, again, that is our modulus of elasticity. Or another word that we use for it sometimes is Young's modulus. Okay, and like I said earlier, that is a measure of how stiff the material is. Um, interesting thing here, your modulus of elasticity stays relatively constant within a material family. So if you're talking about steels, then it doesn't make very much difference how you process the steel. It keeps roughly the same modulus of elasticity, even if it's processed differently than another type of steel. Okay. Now, it might end up a little bit different than stainless steel because stainless steel uh, is only called stainless steel because it does have some uh, iron in it, right? But it is a very different kind of a material. So, um, but anyway, the point is if you're in a particular material family, the, uh, the elastic modulus doesn't actually change very much within that family, okay? So that's good. Elastic modulus, that was one of our items that we needed to look at, okay? What's the next one you want to look at? Okay, someone says yielding strength, and uh, that's going to take us uh, a little bit of, uh, of focus to try to think about our yielding strength, and here's why. Technically, your plastic deformation begins as soon as the first bond breaks in the material. Now, this is where my material model that I had that I've been working with really breaks down, okay? Um, it breaks down because the way real materials work, the bonds are not all just straight in a row. They're very chaotic as to what direction they all go. On average, they start averaging to behaving as if they were just these things that are kind of straight in a row for many, many uh, factors that we might care about. But uh, this is one where that, that starts to have an effect on the behavior of the material because it makes it very difficult for us to know where exactly did the first bond break, right? That curve doesn't tend to all of a sudden change, right? It's kind of a smooth transition into this part, into this nonlinear part. The nonlinearity is an indicator that there are bonds breaking and that there will be permanent deformation, right? But it's hard to tell exactly where it began occurring, okay? So what? How, do, how would we go about um, trying to come up with a consistent technique to where me and my buddy who wants to also do uh, material testing can come up with the same answer as far as where does this uh, plastic deformation begin? What do you think? You got any ideas? Okay. Here, I'll give you one. What if we uh, go back to this idea that there, the, what we're trying to know is whether or not there was permanent deformation? Okay, it is, it is kind of like where does the slope change, but that, um, so that's another suggestion. It's like, well, it's got to be where the slope begins to change. 
The problem with that is that when you do this testing, it isn't a continuous curve. It is a set of points. And once you break it down to where it's not a continuous curve and it's a set of points, there's enough error between any two points that it's hard to say when exactly the slope begins to change. Even though conceptually you're right, it's it, the function, you know, doing it functionally, like do, doing the actual work of trying to figure out where that slope changed isn't easy. It might not even be possible. Okay? So that's another good idea. But what I was going to get to just a second ago is what we're trying to know is whether or not the material has begin to, begun to permanently deform. Right? So let's actually define some finite amount of permanent deformation where we officially say, we will say permanent deformation has occurred when this amount of permanent deformation has occurred. Something we can measure. Right? And let's pick a value, but let's all agree on the same value and say, when this amount has occurred, that's when we'll say that we're into the plastic region. Okay? And I don't know all the history as to why they picked this, but the value that is, has typically been uh, chosen for this purpose is this little value to where you, you more or less show uh, some amount of deformation right here that is 0.2% or a strain value of 0 0.0002. Did I get that? No, 0 0.002, excuse me. So people sometimes refer to this as 0.2%. Uh, what they mean by that is that the definition of strain is itself kind of a percent, right? It's how much did you change in length divided by the original length. So you can think of that as being a percent. And if you have 0.2% of deformation, then people say, oh, okay, I, I think that, you, that permanent deformation has occurred, okay? What you do is you offset on this axis by 0.2%. And then you draw a line that's parallel with the linear portion of the curve over here. And where this line intersects with this curve right here, that's what we will define as being yield strength. Okay? And by the way, I had to, I had to put some space in between those so that you could see that there was some, right? So that we could talk about it. But this is a fairly small amount, right? So it may not actually be as pronounced as what I'm showing up there, right? But anyway, that, that point right there is actually just a little bit beyond where the plastic deformation really began, but it's where we're going to define this idea of yielding strength, okay? And this value right here, sometimes we'll call it sigma sub y to indicate that that's a yielding strength. All right, that's how much stress the material can hold before deforming permanently. Okay? And usually at this point, someone has another comment, right? Let me, let me actually put this and, and write this down. This is yielding strength. Usually at this point, someone has a comment and says, well, is there a name for that point? Right? Because we're saying the point where it really started to go nonlinear is a little bit before where we're defining yield strength. Okay? And the answer is yes. This is known as a proportional limit. Okay? But it's not used as much because it's harder to figure out where exactly it is. We can talk about it in theoretical terms, but in terms of practical terms, it's hard for us to know exactly where that proportional limit is, whereas it's easier for us to define a consistent place where the yielding strength occurs. Okay? All right, so those are two of the items. That's yielding strength, and we had modulus of elasticity before. What else? Okay. Someone says tensile strength, and that is a term that is used for this. Uh, this particular textbook we're using typically refers to this as ultimate strength. Okay? So this thing right here is the ultimate 
strength. Okay, and that stress value at that point that's the most it can reach is that ultimate strength. All right, so those are some interesting things to think about on here. Um, let's go back again and, and, you know, someone mentioned that where this thing actually begins to break might be interesting. It's not totally uninteresting, right? There is something interesting about that point, but it's not what you might think. Um, what that represents is just how much this material was able to deform before losing all of its ability to carry any sort of load, right? And that's the piece of this that's interesting is how much strain occurred from the very beginning out to where that thing let go. Okay, and what this is often referred to is percent elongation at fracture. Okay, and that's important because that is a measure of the ductility of the material. Okay, so I'm going to put that down below. This measures the ductility. Not only that, but I will say, I'll give you an idea so that you know whether or not you, it's appropriate to call a material ductile, right? If your material can stretch at least 5% before breaking, then it's usually considered to be ductile, right? So if it can stretch, you know, strain at fracture, if this is greater than or equal to about 5%, then that means you are ductile. Okay, and that's this value right here is the strain at fracture. All right, um, so this brings up another question. If a material is not ductile, what is it? Okay, you guys already know this, kind of the other end of the uh, ductility spectrum is typically called brittle, right? So let me show you a, a, a stress strain curve for a, a brittle material, kind of a typical brittle material. Okay. And I'm going to do it a little bit smaller because it's less interesting. So think of something like glass or ceramic or something like that that's usually a brittle type of material. We've got stress here, or excuse me, stress there and strain on the horizontal. What do you think the stress strain curve might look like? Okay, it still, it still begins linear. At some point the first bond in the material breaks, but the material it's made out of is not one that rebonds with itself once there's a breakage, right? It's a different. It's differently. It's different at a uh, at a particle level or at a molecular or atomic level. It's different, and it doesn't want to rebond once the first one breaks. Well, once the first one breaks, then that's one less bond that's carrying the load. What happens to all the other bonds? It increases the amount they have to carry because one broke. So they were already close to breaking because everything was close to carrying the amount that would break them before that happened. So once the first one breaks, the next one breaks, and the next one breaks, and this thing breaks. It's a lot less interesting, right? So this is a brittle material here. Okay. Few things about brittle materials. Very often they have, uh, sometimes they have steeper uh, elastic modulus values. They're a lot of times stiffer. So in your mind, maybe you're thinking of glass or ceramic or that kind of thing. Those are often stiffer than materials that are ductile. So they might have a steeper curve in this portion right here. Um, what do you think in terms of, do engineers like to work with brittle materials 
Uh, if, okay, we do sometimes work with brittle materials because sometimes we don't have a choice, right? Sometimes in order to get other properties like heat resistance or, you know, a number of other things that you might need or, you know, being able to withstand abrasion or, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that you might care about. And sometimes the only material that can do what you want to do there is brittle, right? But if we can help it, we would r rather choose a ductile material in most cases. Why do you think that is? Okay, so there's a little bit of a margin of error. You might be able to fix it. The big thing is, a lot of times you will know, you'll notice something changed before there's a catastrophic failure, right? A lot of times for a part that is ductile, you'll see that some, something changed in shape. You know, there's a dent that shows up or the hole elongates or something along those lines. And you say, oh, there's something that changed there and I think it's a problem before there's a catastrophic problem, right? So it's a, it's a common thing for us to prefer to work with ductile materials over brittle materials. Uh, and there's a lot of other reasons too, but that's, you know, one of the reasons why uh, a lot of the materials that we work with are ductile. We prefer to work with them. All right. Now let me show you one other thing here on the material testing, just so we don't leave it. Um, we could also do similar kind of tests, but instead of testing a specimen in a normal orientation, we could do it in a shearing orientation. And what do you think we would find? Okay, let's say we did it all kind of similar, and now what we're going to do is plot uh, shearing stress on the vertical axis and shearing strain on the horizontal axis. What shape do you think we might see? Now, it turns out they typically aren't much different, right? Something like this. But let's actually give some names to the different aspects of this curve so that we can talk about them, right? Because they aren't the same numbers as we had for the normal orientation, so we should probably have different names for the parameters. For instance, what if we take the slope of the linear portion, which now is going to be uh, tau over gamma, that, that slope? Okay, that's called the modulus of rigidity. We give it the letter G, and it's just the slope of that curve in the elastic portion. Okay? What else might matter to us? Okay, the same stuff, right? It's there's this part where it stops to, you know, it stops being elastic, right? And that stress value at that point, um, and so this would be the uh, yielding stress in shear. Okay. Maybe I'll put it just over here, yielding. Stress in shear. What else matters? Okay, ultimate stress in shear. All right, question. Okay, his question is, what kind of a shape would you use to test shear? And uh, the best answer for that is that they will often have a round rod that they will twist. Okay, and we'll get into that. That's actually much later in the course where we look at the stresses that are induced in a, uh, a shaft or something that's like a round member that is uh, subjected to a twisting action. 
but it turns out, and this is a preview of coming attractions, when you do that, they experience basically pure shear on the outer surface of the shaft. And so that's one of the ways that they go about doing the testing for this. Okay? All right, any other questions before we move into our next little uh, excursion into knowledge? All right. Well, then we'll get going. Factors of safety. Okay, and I'll let you have a little preview of the problem that we're about to do in just a second. Let me define for you what a factor of safety is. Okay. Um, a lot of times we'll abbreviate this with uh, just F, like FS, like this. Some books use a letter uh, lowercase n to talk about factor of safety. I don't usually do that in this class because that's not what it has in the book. But say so factor of safety. Here's how we define it. Okay. Um, what we put in the numerator, it's basically a fraction. And what we put in the numerator is a stress. that causes failure. And what we put in the denominator is sometimes known as a working stress. What do you think these might, like, what's a working stress? Right, it's like, how much are you planning on putting on this piece? in practice, like when you're having it do what it needs to do, this whatever the part is that you're designing, when it's doing what it needs to do and it has a particular stress on it, okay, that's the working stress. And then based on material testing, we might have an idea as to the stress that would cause something to fail. So we put that up in the numerator. Now that actually needs to be thought of a little bit more carefully too. What do we mean by failure? Okay, so there's at least two things we've already talked about. Failure can mean uh, permanent deformation. Okay, where does permanent deformation begin? Like you get up to... You get up to your yielding strength, right? You get up to your yielding strength. If you keep on putting more stress on past the yielding strength, you can expect that you will likely uh, cause permanent deformation on the material. Okay? So that's one way. And what's another way? Okay, this is the one we often think of. Okay? I'm just going to call it fracture. That's where you actually make the two pieces come apart. You cause a crack and the you know, two parts actually separate. Okay? And uh, what strength value do you think we would usually use to figure out when something might fracture? Ultimate strength. Okay? So what kind of goes along with our permanent deformation, the strength that we care about for that is usually our yielding strength. And the strength that we usually care about for fracture is usually our ultimate strength. Okay? And this is how we define a factor of safety. Um, and factors of safety are sort of almost a scoring when you're figuring out whether or not you're, des if you're designing something, we're figuring out whether or not your design is adequate. What if you end up with a factor of safety that's lower than one? That means your working stress in the denominator is higher than the stress that causes failure. And that makes you feel bad, right? That, that makes you not want to design it that way. Well, here's another question, though. Do you want to design all your stuff to where the factor of safety is exactly one? Like you say, I'm planning on putting 100 pounds on this part that theoretically can hold exactly 100 pounds, right? Unless you like to live dangerously, you don't want to do that, okay? And here's why. The behavior of materials tends to be more stochastic in nature. That's a nice, big, fancy word. What does it mean? Okay, 
What it means is that the behavior of materials tends to be pretty predictable on average, right? But any one specimen that we get might be a little different, right? So we can kind of predict how they behave, but not in a window that is perfectly deterministic, right? Deterministic is, the, is sort of the other end of the spectrum from stochastic, right? Deterministic means we just know it out to 47 decimal places, whereas... Uh, stochastic means, yeah, we're pretty sure within this little range, right? So there's a little bit of uncertainty is what I'm saying with respect to exactly how much material strength we might have, for instance, okay? What are some other factors that might cause you uncertainty about how much or how close you are to failing a piece? If the load might have to be static versus is someone going to put some sort of a dynamic uh, load on the thing at the same time? So if you're going to you know, think about that broadly, you might say you might have uncertainty about exactly how much load it really needs to carry. Okay? Might be some repetition of the force. So the force might be applied and then released, and then applied and then released. Right? Um, it'll be a while before most of you get to this point, but... You'll, you'll learn about that whenever you get into one of the more advanced courses. There's a uh, property that's called fatigue, or a phenomenon called fatigue. It's where if you apply a load and take it off and apply it again and take it off and you do that for a lot of cycles, your material may get close to failure even though you're not loading it up to the point where hypothetically you should have caused failure based on the stress-strain curve. Okay? So that's a good, another good example. Um, you know, a lot of times this is, uh, you know, when you're designing something and you're a, you're a designer, you have to design against uh, a reasonable level of misuse, right? When you're ever, whenever you're driving along the road and you're about to go across, say, a small bridge out in the middle of the country, right? Do you ever come up to one of those and there's a sign there and it gives you the weights of the trucks that are supposed to be allowed to go across the bridge? Okay. How many of you are 100% confident that no truck heavier than those guidelines on those signs ever went across that bridge? <laughs> okay. So, what do you think the designers of that bridge probably did? Well, they probably applied a little bit of a factor of safety so that they could account for a reasonable amount of misuse. Right, because they don't, even if someone drives too heavy a truck across that bridge, they don't want the bridge to fall down. Right, so there's, this is the type of thing that we think about and we try to think of um, what is a reasonable amount of misuse that we should be able to withstand with our designs. Impurity of the material, right? That would feed into how sure are we of the material properties that we're counting on. Yeah, these are all good suggestions. All right, so let's actually get into this, um, this problem here real quick. We have two cables that are attached to this little block of structural steel. Okay. We would like to, for this piece of structural steel to end up with a factor of safety of 2.5 against fracture. So what we're trying to find is what's the minimum width of that piece, W, so that we end up with a factor of safety of two and a half. Okay. Once we have that, I want us to go further and figure out how much strain we might have right at the middle of the plate. So if I was to do a cross section through the middle of the plate, what's the amount of strain the material is experiencing uh, at that location? Okay. So I've thrown a little bit of a curveball at you here. How so? Okay. There you do need to figure out, so someone suggests, we do need to figure out where it's going to fracture, or like where do we feel like, um, you know, would be our most likely place that this thing might break, given what we, so what do you think? Okay. At the holes, someone says, right? So it's probably not just going to break somewhere here in the middle, right? Because there's more area that helps carry the load there. 
So someone says, no, it's probably more likely to break here at the holes. Right? And the parameter W controls how much area there is to help carry this load. Right? OK, so, so I actually asked this question with some very intentional language here. There might be other factors we would have to control on this body as well, right? Like, in order for it to get up to the stress that would fail that particular plane right there, it means everything else would have had to hold up to the point where it got to that load, right? So someone suggested, well, that's only if the, uh, the little chunk of material doesn't tear out the front first, right? And I agree that might be a separate problem, all right? Figure out how much length do we need beyond the end of the thing so that it doesn't tear out, okay? So, but we're gonna focus on this particular one, say how wide does it need to be so that it doesn't break at that location? All right, so what do you wanna do? Okay, let's remind ourselves, what is a factor of safety? Okay, yeah, the stress that causes failure divided by working stress. In our case, we may not know the working stress, but we can probably set up uh, an expression that gives us working stress in terms of the things that we know and the things that we don't, the, particularly the one thing we don't being W, right? So that part's not that big a deal. How do I know what stress causes failure for this material? Do I need to go find some structural steel and put it in my machine and do some, t some uh, material testing and figure this out? Well, it's going to be two and a half. I need to make it to where the stress that it's experiencing is two and a half times less, lower, right, than the... Um, amount that will cause failure, but I do need to know what amount will cause failure for this material, right? And that's a material property. So um, you get someone said it a second ago, maybe there's some information like that in charts. Like maybe other people have done material testing and figured out the uh, factors that matter to us. <coughs> do you think maybe that happened? Do you think that may even be a table that's in the back of your textbook? Like maybe even table A17? A table that may have even been uh, photocopied and made available to you on Moodle? OK. This is a table you're going to get familiar with. Um, this is the, uh, the US units version of it. There's actually right next to it. There's another one that's for SI units, okay? But we're dealing with a, uh, a problem in US units, so I'll stick with this, okay? Now, what do I need to know off of this table? Okay, someone says ultimate strength, right? For what? Okay, so I have structural steel right here. So I'm gonna read across, and I see this number right here. Right? 66 KSI. What's that? Okay. Kilopounds per square inch. Okay. So 1,000 pounds per square inch is what, is what KSI stands for. Okay. And so when we are dealing with our factor of safety equation where we say 2.5, this is, you know, remember up here, we're shooting for a factor of safety of a certain amount. I'm going to plug in that value of 2.5. The stress that causes failure is 66 KSI. Okay. And if I want to convert that into something like PSI instead of KSI, what, do, what, what should I do? Okay. There are 1,000 PSI in a KSI. Okay. So I would multiply this by 1,000 PSI per KSI. 
Okay. Now, what do I put in the denominator? Okay. I need to put in my formulation of what stress is it actually holding, right? And so what is that stress? 6,000 pounds divided by cross-sectional area of the part that might fail, right? Which would be the thickness, 0.4 inch, times what? W minus half an inch. Okay. Now that's a single variable equation. So what can we do with it? Solve it. All right. Well, that's nice uh, that we're going to be able to solve this. Um, while I'm punching this in here, so I'm going to start showing you here that once you get something into a single variable equation, there's no reason you have to manipulate it algebraically if you have one of these calculators. You can just start typing. 2.5 equals a fraction, 66 times 1,000, right? While I'm doing this, though, I'm going to make a comment, and that is that um, I did ignore something here that uh, I don't want to you know, give someone who's trying to go and actually design one of these things in the real world. I don't want them to use this um, exactly like I'm doing it. The reason why is that I'm ignoring something that I haven't really talked to you about yet very much, and that's something called stress concentrations. Okay? We will get to that. It's one of the last things we do in this course. Um, Suffice it to say that what I've just done this based on is what's called a nominal stress. Okay? And it's not bad calculations. This is still useful even after you learn about stress concentrations, but it's not really the complete story just yet. So, but we'll still do it. All right, I think I've got it all in there. Is that right? So what I do now, now that I've got the equation put in, you might see above the calc key it says solve. So I'm going to get that by hitting shift and then the calc key. Um, I already had a value stored into x, and if I don't change this value, this is going to be its first guess in its iterative solution internally that it does to try to find x. Okay? So usually that's okay just to leave it alone for most of the problems that you guys most of the time do. If you have an equation that's nonlinear, sometimes it's important that you get a better guess. Right? This is a linear equation that I'm about to solve, so the uh, exact value that's in x uh, didn't really matter. Okay? And so when I hit equals, it has now solved for x. And what is it telling me there? Okay? The width that I need there is 1.068 inches. Okay, and that's W. So that's how wide I should make this piece so that I hit my goal of two and a half factor of safety against fracture, again remembering that I'm ignoring stress concentrations with this particular method. Yeah? Say that a little louder. Ah, so his, his point is, shouldn't we technically round this answer up? Why would he say that? Yeah, so, you know, I, I definitely appreciate the, uh, the sentiment. I'm not sure if we have any tools that will measure a ten-thousandth of an inch, right? But if we did, and we were that ten-thousandth of an inch shy, right, then that might matter, right? We might be... Uh, a factor of safety of 2.49999 if we made it just a little bit shy of the actual number. But I'm, I'm being a little bit silly here. The, the basic idea is right. You know, you want to make sure you don't go less than whatever this minimum threshold is, right? So I'll encourage you with that. That's like, yes, your thinking is right. Whether or not it practically would matter, 
Probably not because we probably don't even have tools that will know whether or not we were a ten thousandth of an inch short. Right. Yeah. Um, so the question is, if you try to solve this in your calculator and you get something totally off, what does that mean? Uh, for this particular problem, that probably means something wasn't entered quite right because there's not that much that can go wrong um, as far as the internal solution process for this particular set of information. So when we get finished here, I'll take a look and I'll see if I can find what, what may have gone wrong. Um, let's go ahead and do the last piece of this problem. Um, what's that last piece? Okay, strain of the cross section. How would I know that? Okay. Do I know the length of this body? That's not one of the givens. So I can't do like delta L over L and find it by definition. How might I go about finding it? Let me ask you this. Do I know the stress at the location it's asking about? OK. So I know the stress at the location they're asking about. And let me ask another question. Do I think that this thing is in its elastic region? OK. How would I know whether or not this piece was in its elastic region? Go back to the chart, right? So let's look at the chart here real quick and say, I, you know, the stress that I, uh, that I said I couldn't exceed was 66 KSI, right, at the, uh, you know, at those critical locations, right? But I'm actually two and a half times less than that. So how much stress do I actually have at my critical locations? 66 divided by two and a half is what will actually be occurring at those critical locations. OK, so that's 26.4, you say? OK, even at the critical locations, then, do you feel like I will be yielding the material? How do you know that? Okay. says the elastic strength is 36 KSI, and you're saying that 66 divided by 2.5 is more like 26? Okay. So based on the fact that we use this factor of safety, yeah, it's not, we're not up in that range where we're plastically deforming the material. We're in the elastic region of the material, most likely. Okay. Further, if you look at the actual problem, I'm not even asking you for the strain at the hole. Where am I asking you for the strain? In the middle, right? Kind of right in here. Will the stress be more or less there? Less, right? It's going to be even less than the 26 number that he just cited for me, right? So I'm definitely in a zone where I'm probably still elastic. So now let's figure out how would I determine the strain if I can figure out the stress? Okay, modulus of elasticity. Go back into the table again. Where's the modulus of elasticity? OK, it's over here. For structural steel, this says 29, but look up here, 1,000 KSI. That's kind of tricky. OK, this is 29,000 KSI. Right, because of the heading of the table, it says 1,000 KSI. Okay, so what I'll do here is for this, uh, for this problem, we're saying that 29,000 KSI, that's our elastic modulus, this is going to be equal to the stress that it's experiencing at the middle of the part over the strain that I'm trying to find. How do I determine the stress at the middle of the part? Okay, 6,000 pounds divided by what? 
cross-sectional area, which is just going to be equal to 0.4 inches times 1.068 inches that we just found. So I'm saying all of that over the strain that I'm looking to find should be equal to 29,000 KSI. Okay? Do I have a units issue at this point? Okay? I mean, technically I don't because I labeled all of them, right? But the fact that I labeled all of them lets me see that if I just punch it straight in a calculator, it will end up giving me something that's off unless I put a factor in somewhere, right? Where should I put the factor in? Okay, there's a thousand PSI in a KSI. Okay, so now I can go ahead and enter this. We can say 29,000 times 1,000 is equal to 6,000 over 0.4 times 1.068. Okay, all of this divided by the strain, which I'll just put in as x. and I'll have it solve, okay? And what's that value? 4.843 times 10 to the negative four. Okay? And that's not, that doesn't worry us because these strain values typically are pretty small, right? It doesn't usually stretch very much, you know, relative to its original length. So, you know, we're okay with this. All right. Who's got questions or comments? Yes, sir. Could you explain how you found the fraction? The fraction that I just wrote up there with the 29,000? Okay, so this first equation that I got right here came from my definition of a factor of safety. I just populated that equation, right? In the numerator, I put my stress that causes failure. In the denominator, I put my working stress, okay? My second equation there, this one right here, I got from the relationship for Young's modulus based on this chart up here, right? Elastic modulus is equal to stress over strain. Okay, I happen to know for the material that was identified what the elastic modulus is, and I also could figure out how much stress the material was carrying so I can then solve for strain. because I know that the material uh, is operating in the elastic region. Good questions. Anything else?